first-time visitors that we have at High Noon Club this afternoon. Great to have you. My name is Bob Damon. I'm the moderator of the High Noon Club. And the High Noon Club, we started this club just about five years ago. Not quite, but we're getting real close to five years. And since that time, we've had a really a good time of hopefully providing our public with a lot of good information i.e. regarding our government, our governments, federal and state. And today will be the same type of information. We're going to have our guest speaker today as a, a national type speaker out of Washington, D.C. in one of the major newspapers and also a journalist on different top radio programs today, Emily Miller. So we want to thank her and we appreciate H&H &H Gun Range, uh, or shooting sports, excuse me, H&H &H shooting sports, the old habits die very difficult, especially when you get old, the, uh, very difficult. But we appreciate Miles Hall and bringing in uh, Emily Miller. Every, every high noon club, we start out with doing two things. An opening prayer, then I'm going to ask, where's Pastor Steve Kernan? Right beside you. Where is he? Right there. Okay, where is he? He has American veteran, Marine veteran, Vietnam veteran vest. We're going to do an opening prayer, and then we're going to pledge allegiance to the American flag. And I will lead the pledge allegiance to the American flag, which is up front. So if you'll please stand for opening prayer, we appreciate it. Let's pray. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we're so thankful that we can come because of your grace, because of your mercy. We thank you so much, Father, for this Christmas season and what it means to all of us. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in our relationship with you and then the freedom that we have in this nation. Lord, to, uh, to be free to believe what we believe and to say what we believe. Lord, we just pray that you'll help us to be strong in our faith, continue to stand for our rights. Lord, we pray that you'll be with this nation. We've come a long way from our founding. But Lord, I thank you for our groups like this, that Lord are educating and giving people the, the right kind of information that they need. Lord, uh, we just pray for our troops that are in harm's way. And for those that are around the world that are not able to be home for Christmas, we pray that, Lord, uh, your comfort would be with them. And, Lord, especially for the families who, who have loved ones who will never be coming home for Christmas because they pay the ultimate price. Lord, uh, we pray special grace for them today. We just commit this meeting to you. We thank you, Lord, for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Right off the bat here, let's talk about how many have heard about Duck Commander and Duck Dynasty. Joe Roberts. Okay. okay. We're, we're, we're working up. We need the little cactus. Okay, here's actually what happened. There's always a next part of the story that most people never hear about. I hate to tell you, I'm the new Phil Robertson. He's gone, I'm the new guy. Thank you very much. Now, now wait a minute. Y'all are part of my dysfunctional family. We got so we can get you every one of you on TV. We, no, that's not. See, we know that the liberal movement in America is never going to stop doing what they do. At the same time, our conservative movement needs to always understand that same thing. We're not going to stop either. The, so we've got this little loggerhead kind of going on. The Second Amendment that Emily's going to discuss today is just one of them. Now, the other one's going on is this deal with freedom of speech or First Amendment rights. Don't ever fool yourself that they're going to stop. But at the same time, let's not let them think that we're ever going to stop either. Now, if you agree with that, please give me a round of applause. Thank you. We've been so blessed in America 
to have the opportunity to come up, come down here and talk about freedom of speech, Second Amendment, Tenth Amendment, all the different amendments we have. And we're so blessed to have almost on every week to have state legislators or state representatives or state municipal representatives in this meeting room. If you are a public elected person, would you please stand up? And let us salute you and give you a round of applause. Stand up. Thank you very much for your service. Now, if you are an American veteran, would you please also stand up? Thank you. I can't believe that you guys actually were young one time either. Because you were all in the old days. Okay. Now, there's a real special veteran to me in this house. The, uh, uh, and I can say that because I'm a veteran at the same time. But there's one real special to me, and I'm going to ask this guy right here, Miles Hall, to talk about how special he is. Uh, Y'all read the paper recently. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I have to admit, when I saw this, I was I was just ecstatic. Uh, but there was a wonderful story about Bill here on the front row with us. And uh, and I called a friend of mine who actually had it produced in what they call a slick version, and we framed it just for you. Bill's the last surviving member of the USS Oceana. actually goes to the schools to, to help remind children because a lot of them I don't think have a clue about what transpired and so thank you very much for, for doing that I hope you enjoy that by the way that was a, awesome awesome okay now that, now that we got that technical difficulty taken care of and changed the batteries up we'll use this little portable mic FDZ, as a lot of you may know or may not, is, is one of the only survivors left from the battleship Oklahoma. So again, what I'm going to ask you from Bob Daney, please give him one more round of applause and thanks again. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want some time? You want to say anything? What's that? No, he said no. He didn't want to say anything. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, okay, let's get started here. Now today we've got a very special guest speaker uh, coming, and what we're going to do is I'm going to let Miles Hall introduce our guest, and then I think 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever you want to talk about, and then we'll do a Q&A right after that. So again, get ready for Q&A. Now here's how we do a Q&A at High New Club. We don't talk individually at tables, so take this one, everybody here. I will control the mic. How many of you have seen the old Phil Donahue show where he wrote in the audience and all that kind of stuff? I'm that Phil Donahue. So raise your hand, and when, you, when I give you the mic or we, I get the mic to your face or whatever, please just give us your very first name. Just your first name. And if you get the opportunity to ask two questions, give us your first name again. Reason for that, we want to get to know you, you get to know us, and it'll be a lot more fun that way. Miles Hall. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I, uh, I can't tell you how exciting this is. Um, um, I have talked with Emily for, oh gosh, it's close to a year, a little over a year now, and about various things. And, and uh, one of the things I try very hard to do in the shooting family is to educate as many people as I can with what's going on that we know about. Um, and she uh, called me one afternoon, and we, we struck up a friendship. and. Uh, she started asking me questions, and then at one point I sent her some information. She said, oh, by the way, my book is out, and uh, this is her book, and, uh, and you're in it. And my first thought was, oh, dear. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, but it's actually an incredibly well-written book, and, and uh, it is, it's a great honor to, to get to meet her. She's a wonderful, fun person, which, uh, which I'm really happy about. We actually got together yesterday, went out last night and had dinner, which was neat. Uh, she was awarded the 2012 Clark Molinoff Award for investigative reporting from the Institute on Political Journalism. She also makes regular appearances on national TV and radio. She lives in Washington, D.C., and she is the uh, senior editor for the Washington Times. Now, what you're gonna hear today is her unique journey to buying a gun. 
which is slightly different than it is in Oklahoma. <laughs> On a personal note, this is also her first visit to Oklahoma. Um, yeah, which is, 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 is that's pretty cool. Also, when she landed at the airport, some of her uh, fellow uh, uh, team members at the paper called and said, are you there and are you okay? <laughs> you know, and she said, oh yes, they're here, they're nice folks, you know. And so I, uh, we actually had that discussion about some of the uniquenesses and the perceptions of Oklahoma, you know, so. Um, the book, if you haven't had a chance, we, we have copies of these books out at the gunsmith counter and over at the knife counter. Uh, once the meeting is over, if you would like to buy the book, we have got them out there. It'll be an even 25 is kind of the way we rigged it up for it. She will then uh, be sitting at the table just outside the door after the meeting is over. If you would like to have her autograph them for you, uh, we would be uh, thrilled and she's going to have time to do that. She does have to catch a flight back before the big storm comes in that they're talking about. Uh, so she'll be here for a little bit after the meeting is over with. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a wonderful lady, a great writer, and now a fellow shooter, <laughs> Emily Miller. She asked my, I, I think I've been in Oklahoma for 18 hours now. I can't wait to come back. You all are so friendly. And um, I ate so much last night. <laughs> it was the one thing everybody said here in Oklahoma get a steak. So I had the bone and filet. I think everybody was shocked by how much I could eat in one sitting. Um, but everyone's been so warm and friendly. Miles, thank you so much for having me here. We have developed a friendship by phone. I interview him frequently for the Washington Times um, to give insights into what's going on with gun sales around the country and the types of people, and um, it's just been an invaluable resource for me, and it is such a pleasure to be here, and it was such an esteemed group, and so many veterans, and truly honored. Um, so I, as Miles referenced, I got a gun um, a, a little less than two years ago for the first time, and in fact, I'm so new to all of this. I only shot a gun for the first time two years ago. And so this is um, a completely new experience. And what drove me to get a gun, uh, living in Washington, D.C., we have very high crime. And while the rest of the country is experiencing less crime every year, which is a great thing, it goes up in D.C. every year, double digits, gun, whether it's assault with a gun, homicides, um, robbers with a gun, rape, murder, all this stuff. Um, I was, this was a few years ago, and I was dog sitting for some friends, and it was New Year's Day, and I went to take the dog for a walk really quickly before going to a New Year's party, and I did not lock the front door, which maybe some of you who live in America don't do, but in Washington, D.C., you have to do that, and I lazily just closed the door and didn't lock it. Well, I walked back into the house with the dog, and there was a man in there robbing it, and um, he, he, he robbed me, took my wallet, and by the grace of God, didn't hurt me physically. Um, the other stupid decision I made that day, and lesson learned, is I decided I was gonna get a picture of the drug addict robber for the police. So I, I followed him, and I got to the end of the driveway, and there were two pickup trucks parked there, and about 15 men standing outside the trucks. So they had been casing the whole neighborhood. And they obviously didn't expect me to suddenly walk up to them. And I obviously didn't expect there to be 15 other people there, <laughs> men. Um, so at that point, I was absolutely terrified. Uh, and they started to come at me. And I sprinted back in the house, called the police. And so the police did, you know, they, I have to say, good in credit, they did try to investigate and find them. And they said it's a, become a very common thing in DC where people from, because I knew, the, I caught the license plates from Virginia, and he said they come in to get the drugs downtown and on the way out try to get some quick cash. And um, anyway, going to bed that night, one of the things the police did is they, they carefully went through the house, the windows, it was a big house, windows and doors to make sure they had not been left open, because I guess criminals will often, if they get interrupted or don't have time to finish their crime, will leave a little door window cracked so they can come back in and get some more stuff. And I mean, I'd never known this before and heard this. And so going to bed that night, I was absolutely terrified. And I've never been so terrified in my life, thinking, what if they come back in? You know, they're on drugs, 
there are all these men. What would I do? How would I defend myself? And in the, my entire life, it was the first time I ever thought, oh, if I just had a gun by the night table, I, had, like, I could defend myself. I would have a chance in this situation. And um, I didn't have a gun. And so what I did instead is I took a dresser and, and shoved it in front of the door and barricaded myself into the bedroom. This is DC's version of self-defense. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had to barricade myself out in the morning. I didn't get much sleep. So the next day I went on Twitter. I'm a big Twitter person um, and at, at Emily Miller. And I just sent out this tweet and just said, I'm thinking about getting a gun in DC. And the reaction was just like, so, and it was a holiday. <laughs> oh, what are you kidding? Forget it. You can't. It's impossible. Nobody can. Call the NRA, gotta get some help, you'll never do it. It was all this negativity. I, I couldn't, I didn't, I knew the Supreme Court had overturned the 30 year handgun ban in DC because in the Heller decision in 2008, which was a landmark decision. I knew it was legal, but I didn't realize what had happened since. So I got a little bit more information. I knew the DC had put in laws, it's called what they call registration, which means that every gun that you buy, specifically each gun, has to be registered with the city. Um, so it's unlike a carry permit, and it's the fact that you get a carry permit, you can, well, one, you can take your gun out of your house. DC does not let you take your gun out of your house at all. They do not recognize the right to bear arms, even though it is in the Constitution. Um, and then they have this registration, so every single gun you buy, you have to go through the police to do it. And I didn't realize what they had done by doing this. They had put in so many steps. So I went to my editor, and I said, I'm getting a gun for my home defense. What do you think about, I write about it for Washington Times. And I said, I think it'll take about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, sure, that's great. You know, go ahead, do that. So I went down, I knew nothing. I didn't know where to buy a gun. I didn't know where to start. I had no idea how the process worked. And I wanted my readers to learn it for, with me because you know, it's not if you've not grown up in that culture, um, you don't know this thing. So I went through it. Just did not do any research. Did not look in. I just went through it. I went down to police headquarters. I went online and found the firearms registration section. I went online and I went to the police station and I walked in. And um, as I've always been, whenever I walked in the registry office, the only one there because there's just not a lot of people going through this process. And I said, I'm here to get a gun. And uh, this, there was a female police officer, and she said, well, do you have a gun? I said, no, no, I need to get a gun. And I said, I think I, I need to get a permit for a gun. She said, oh, you can't get a permit. Because <laughs> I didn't know the language. I didn't know that permit meant carry. I, I thought it was like getting a car, you get a driver's license, or you can get a car. And she said, oh, you can't get a permit. You can't go carrying it around. She said, you just need to go get a gun, and then you bring it in here, and we'll approve it. And then you need to do this. And then you need to take a class, and then you need to do ballistics, and then you'll take this written test, and then you need to study this packet. And she started passing all this paper across the counter to me. I mean, it ended up being a stack about that big. That big. I was like, what in the world? So she said, so go, and I said, well, where do I go to get a gun? I don't know. They don't sell them in DC. <laughs> so I sort of walked out confused, and I took all my paper home, and I went through it, and I, went, I decided there's no, I need to figure this out. So I figured I went through all the paper and all the stuff. It turns out there were 17 steps it took to get a gun, to get a gun registered. So I laid it all out so I could follow it, my readers could follow along, because I'm gonna go through each one of these meticulously. In the end, it took me four months to get my gun registered. So four months and then it cost four hundred and thirty-five dollars in government fees. To go through those 17 steps. In fact, by the time I got done, I found out there was actually 22 steps. But at least uh, they, there's things that you can find along the way you don't even realize. Um, and why I was inspired to write this book, Emily Gets Her Gun, that was the name of my series in the Washington Times, which was just about what it took to get a gun in DC. And gun control was on the national level and political level, sort of on the back burner at this point, or in 2011 and into 2012. But what changed was the end of 2000, I got my gun in, 2000, in February 2012, so it, it, my two year anniversary is coming up, my SIG. Um, <laughs> oh, I got a SIG Sour T2, not just the one that's on the cover of my book, um, in nine millimeter. 
But, and it's, and to end the start part, to tell you at the beginning of when I said I don't want to be vulnerable again at home, I have my gun loaded on my bedside table. So, if anybody ever breaks in, that they will, I will not be a victim right, again. Right. So that's definitely the thing. Right. Um, but what inspired me with this book is I got this kind of in the beginning of 2012, February 2012, my, I finally got through step 17 and they let me take my gun home. And, um, and then soon after, by the end of the year, by October, November, Barack Obama was elected to a second term. And then very soon after that was this horrendous tragedy at Newtown, these 20 children were killed. The combination of those two things, Obama is long-term, I go through his history, his history, my book, has been a long-term anti-gun person. In fact, you go back to 1996 and he was running for state house and he filled out a questionnaire and said, do you support the banning of handguns in general? And he said yes. And he expanded on it a little bit later, four years later, and said that he didn't think it was logical, practical to, to ban all handguns, but he still supported it. So this has been going, he's, he's had a, you know, almost 20 year agenda on banning guns, but he knew he couldn't get reelected. So you never heard him talk about banning guns or gun control in his first term. Once he got reelected, and that's why we saw so many of you who are Second Amendment supporters around the country saying in 2012 election, if he gets reelected, he's going to go for your guns. And you heard the media and you heard the left saying, you know, they're trying to scare people into buying guns. This is all rhetoric. Well, I mean, he wasn't reelected a month for six weeks, and all of a sudden he's got a new gun control agenda. And sadly, he exploited this Newtown tragedy to do so. You know, there's, and I, I think it's shameful the way he has, but that's what he used it. And what what I saw, what I, why I wrote this book is because I, as I said, it took me four months and 17 steps to get a legal gun. And I'm a law-abiding person. I'm not gonna go murder someone. The gun control laws that President Obama has been pushing this year and has successfully pushed in seven states already, wants to get through on a federal level, I see how that affects, it, how that is affected in reality. What happens is law-abiding people like me can't get guns to defend themselves because it takes so long and these laws are in place. And then the criminals, they don't care what the laws are because they're criminals. So they're gonna get their guns anyway. So all of these seven states that have passed these laws and this effort on the federal level to do so, this is about, this is not about public safety. This is about this rapidly anti-gun belief that they can control more of our lives. And the difference between now and the, the difference between now and say 20 years ago, the last time we really had a major debate in this country over gun control, the one big factor that makes this one much more serious and why they've had more success this year is Mike Bloomberg. We've got this billionaire, and I can never keep track of my billions he has, we've got a lot of billions. And he is willing to spend any amount of money to push for gun control. He is a megalomaniac. And he has spent so much money in 2012, and then this year leading up to the vote in the Senate, which was in April, he spent millions more. He just throws money after this. And unfortunately, money talks in politics, and he's had success, and that's why we've seen in 2013, we saw New York pass a crazy gun control laws. So you can only load your gun with seven rounds, as if the criminals are walking around counting out the number of rounds they've loaded and stopping at seven. I mean, this is a crazy law. This is not gonna change anything. And then we've got, um, excuse me, we've got this passing on all kinds of levels and in all these other states. And what was really shocking, I thought, mostly of all, is you've got the, you know, New Jersey, Delaware, Connecticut, Maryland, all these crazy laws, but where it really was shocking was when it hit Colorado. And I think that really woke up America, because if you go that far west, Colorado is a long time pro-gun, hunting tradition, you know, ranchers, farmers, hunters, tradition. And if you could pass in Colorado, you know, that's all of a sudden, it's broken out of the sort of liberal blue state, upper northeast world. And, you know, the Colo Coloradans had that very successful recall, two recall election. They recalled for the first time in state history, two statewide senators in Democratic districts, put in Republicans. There's really incredible example of democracy this year. Yeah. And I applaud. 
taught them, and I've been to Colorado a couple of times on this book tour, and I, uh, they are amazing what they did, and it was absolutely grassroots. You know, you'll hear Bloomberg or Obama say it was the, you know, corporate gun lobby, it was the Republican Party. It was not at all. It was totally grassroots. They were outspent five to one by Bloomberg, and they still won those two elections. And now a third one they went after, and she just resigned. And that was the biggest example of fighting back we've seen this year in a democracy. But unfortunately, as wonderful as that is, and successful as that was, it's not going to change the fact that those people are still living under these two new laws that have been passed. They call what they call universal background check, which means anybody who, you know, you and you and Miles want to trade guns, you have to go to go here, do a next check. Why does that why is that stupid? Because the criminals who are exchanging guns the, they're not going to stop and go to H&H &H Sports and get the Knicks check. No. I mean, they're just not going to do it. You guys will, because you want to be above the law and you want to do it. I will. But the bad guys aren't doing it. So it's essentially, so unfortunately, I was saying is Colorado, is as great as those recalls were, unfortunately, they're going to be living under these laws, as are these seven other states, as long as these things work through the courts. Uh, my purpose of my book, though, is to arm people with facts of gun control because we have this national debate going, and we've got Obama deliberately, very much deliberately misleading the public on gun rights and on gun control and on crime. And he has a liberal media. I'm a member of the media, but our paper is a conservative opinion page. You look at the liberal media, especially television, they're helping Obama confuse the public deliberately. Um, you've heard Obama say things this year, we've got to get weapons of war off our streets. We, have, we can't have weapons of wars in our movie theaters, referencing Aurora, Colorado. You won't know. There are no automatic weapons on the streets. I mean, that's just not true. And they're not weapons of war. We don't send our, our, all of you veterans here. How would you feel if we sent you with only semi-automatic guns overseas? Um, and then he said, this one I thought was, of all his misleading ones and lies this year, the one I found to be most uh, sickening was he said, it was at a fundraiser in San Francisco, of course. Um, he said, we, will never, we should not allow those children who got killed at Newtown by a semi-automatic, he goes, but sorry, he, he said, I mean, let me correct myself, a fully automatic gun. So he corrected himself to lie. And I mean, you all know it was not a fully automatic gun. It's just not fact. But, he, you know, people in San Francisco don't know that. They don't know what's going on. I mean, they're uneducated on this issue, and they don't know the facts. And so I, I you know, I have a book stack full of facts with a very big appendix and reference material, and you can look it up, and I want people to have that firsthand information, primary information themselves, when having this debate. But the three main, there are three main facts that I am trying to get across and trying and going around talking to people to get across that I think we should all know and be able to tell people when we have these debates, people who are either undecided on the gun control issue or maybe anti-gun and, and don't don't really understand the facts so they're getting it from, from the White House or they're getting it from the media. And the first one is that, so important, no gun control law has ever reduced crime. Fact. The Centers for Disease Control, which is actually a very anti-gun group, government group, did a two-year study, and they looked at every possible gun control law in the books, whether it's the full registration, whether it's assault, assault weapons ban, but that quotes, um, whether it's you know carry permits, whatever it is, they never saw any reduction in crime. Well, crime is down in the United States, but it has never changed based on the gun control laws in the state. That's number one. Harvard also did a similar study and proved the same thing. So you can't <laughs> judge it on the liberal anti-gun CDC. You can go by a liberal Harvard who has, you know, they couldn't do it either. They couldn't prove it. So number one, no gun control law has ever reduced crime. Number two, there is no correlation between gun ownership and gun crime. Gun ownership right now is the highest rate it's ever been. There are over 300 million guns in this country, probably more. And about half, according to Gallup, about half of the country's family have a gun in the home. So we have the highest gun ownership ever. However, gun homicides have decreased steadily since 1993. The point that the gun homicide rate between 1993 and 2012, according to the FBI, is 50%. It's down, it's half of what it was. 
And if you look at non-fatal shootings, such as shootings, it's down 70%. So while gun ownership is going like this, gun crime is going like this. So, well, I, uh, for example, I was on Piers Morgan's show. Oh. I'm sorry. I survived going on Piers Morgan's show. And you can find that on YouTube, it's pretty funny. But anyway, he, at one point he says to me, just says, Emily, you know, the more gun crimes, guns there are, the more crimes there are. And, and he kept talking and I said, wait, hold, that's not true. And I, I, I said to him, gun, no, Piers, gun, I said exactly what I just told you all, gun crime, is, gun crime has gone down 50% in 20 years, gun ownership the highest rates ever. But if I hadn't been on this show, most people are on the show, they watch CNN, they think that's the facts. And here's how, how bad it's become in America and how un, uh, the lack of knowledge on this issue is uh, Pew, which is another pollster, Pew Research did a poll in June of this year. And they asked people, do you think gun crime, homicides, or any gun crime, in the past five, 10, 15 years, they did different time periods, is up, down, or the same. 88% of the American public said it's up or the same. Which, if you flip that, that means only one out of 10 Americans knows that gun crime is down. And it's not just down. Homicides are down 50%, 70% on non-fatal shootings. But only one out of 10 Americans know that. And it's because of this White House, and it's because of people like Piers Morgan. And I don't blame people for you know, watching TV news and not knowing the difference, but I hope people are more educated on facts. And that's why I'm hoping you know you and you know as you can spread the word on this. The third fact that I would like to get across is as much as Obama, like for example, after this that sad Navy Yard shooting in DC recently, which is another mass shooting, he said, once again we're having these mass shootings. You know, once again. And um, the truth is, the um, Congressional Research Service, which is the nonpartisan research arm of Congress, did a study in April, and they looked at 30 years of mass shootings, which is defined as four or more people killed in a public place by someone they don't know. That's how we define it. The government defines it. And they looked at 30 years, and, gun and mass shootings are not up. Even though it may seem so because of the way the media covers them now, they're not increased. Unfortunately, they're not decreased. And then, unfortunately, even more unfortunately, they conclude there's really nothing we can do to prevent them because they're so out of the blue. These people, we don't know that they're gonna blow. We don't know that's coming. There's no, you're generally not a pattern of violence. But they looked at these 30 years and the steadiness of mass shootings and it averages to about 18 deaths a year. Now there are over 9,000 people shot and killed every year in this country, 18 from these mass shootings. So when Obama, when the liberal media fixate on these things, they're doing it to scare people, deliberately to scare people. Because if you're gonna get shot in this country and killed, you're gonna get shot and killed in the city. It's not gonna be in a mall, it's not gonna be a movie theater, it's not gonna be a school. It happens, it's very rare, it's not likely. So when they say that, it's done to scare you. Um, and you know, I, again, with these facts, this liberal media, I was on one more story on these, these facing down these CNN people, I was on Anderson Cooper's show, and it was after the Navy Yard shooting, and there was one of his guests, this analyst named Cornell Belcher, and he just said, you know, these mass, well actually I should say, everyone on the panel kept talking about how the mass shootings are so much worse, and the country's going to hell in a handbasket, and, well they wouldn't say hell, but, um, <laughs> in Oklahoma, so I won't, how bad, this, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, these mass shootings are so much worse, what's happening to our country, we need to pass our gun control laws, this is so terrible, on, on, on. Finally, I interrupt and I said, so Cornell, I just pointed to him, and I said, why, why do you say mass shootings are up? Because I knew he couldn't yet. So he said, um, well, because they're happening all the time. <laughs> and I said, um, well, Cornell, no, no, he said, well, the fact is, they're happening all the time. And I said, well, here's a real fact. Congressional research did a study, and it's about eight, they're not increased or decreased. And so that, this is the stuff that gets perpetuated, and it's hard to stop unless we have better education. Well, you know, what we're looking now is, where do we go from here? And Obama has said he will get gun control passed on the federal level, on the national level, before his term is over. He is determined to do that. They think that they can keep pushing to get these 60 votes they need in the Senate, they we have obviously have a big midterm election coming up in 2014. 
Bloomberg has said he's, uh, he's just announced he's going to spend $25 million to get his program people elected. He just spent a million dollars in Virginia to help McCollum get elected and pass gun control. And so this year is going to be a big year for gun control and getting the people elected. And the funny thing is, is that what they don't understand, what, what Obama and Bloomberg and all these guys don't seem to understand is that all of, their, all of what they're doing is driving good law-abiding people to buy more guns. And one of the chapters in my book is that Barack Obama is the best gun salesman in history. Yeah. 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 We're afraid, and it's not, well, we're afraid that our, the guns gonna get banned, so you just wanna get one before they go get banned, but it's because we believe in the Second Amendment, we believe in the right to defend ourselves. Our founding fathers gave us that right. Um, and so, as we are talking about earlier, about my, my friend Miles Hall, and shooting, what I think is so interesting, one of the things I learned from him, is about where the industry has moved this year. We've had, I mean, gun sales have been gangbusters since 2012, when everyone saw Obama about to get reelected, and then when he started calling for gun control last year. Um, so I just wanted to read you a little bit from my book about somebody you may know here. I also spoke to a few independent retailers around the country about their experiences. At H&H Shooting Sports in Oklahoma City, gun sales and range attendance have gone gangbusters. According to owner Miles Hall, revenue was 15 million in 2009. It went down slightly in 2010 and 11, and then hit 23 million in 2012. He, yeah, no, he's doing that. <laughs> he expects revenue of 25 million in 2013. The company was founded in 1981, employs 117 people, and they, or whatever industry, you know, who else is hiring in this economy? <laughs> and has an economic impact of 128 million on the local economy. And that's fantastic. Hall is a meticulous record keeper. I bet you all know that already. He counts the number of people who come into his 82,000, I will correct that now, 90,000 square foot complex. It's grown since this book came out a few months ago to buy a gun or shoot at his 61 person indoor range. He said that 187,000 people came in H&H &H in 2001, but that skyrocketed to 740,000 people by 2012. He said, last year, thousands showed up, people we had never seen before. That's a lot of daggone people. Yeah. <laughs> and I quoted him directly. Oklahoma, he said, only has 4.2 million people, and over 700,000 of them came through my door. He expects to see over a million customers this year. As high as the numbers were leading up to Obama's reelection, Hall saw a spike after Newtown. When the, he said, when the tragedy struck Sandy Hook, the initial buying push was not guns, but safes. And I've seen them at the end of their store here. You can go see the expanded safe. I've never seen so many safes in my life. It's the biggest in the country, right? And I think it's just remarkable. Um, that's what people, and Hall said, people said, I don't want irresponsible folks getting my stuff, and I don't want thieves getting them either, he told me. It was not until after the administration made the statements about banning guns did the buying binge start. It was off the charts. We sold as much in a week as we did in an entire year, only a few years back. He said people were lined up 40 deep to buy, gun, buy whatever guns they could find in stock. Everything that went out the door was platform guns, he said, the so-called assault weapons, you know, a basic semi-automatic rifle with a rail, and then went the handguns, and then went the shotguns. As long as we had it, we could sell it. We went from 3,000 guns in the building to fewer than 100 in one week in last year in December. Hall has noticed a significant change in the type of customer in recent years, which he attributes to a fear of safety in their homes as well as Obama's push for gun bans. Everyone back east thinks it's just old white men getting guns, said Hall. <laughs> That's not this new breed at all. They are in their mid-30s, ethnically across the board, almost 50% women, and understand the value of guns. Industry leaders and corporate and independent retailers who I spoke with along the way, all separately reported the same exact thing that Miles has said to me. There's a new demand that defies common stereotypes. More women, urban dwellers, and younger people have entered what was largely a rural male and southern culture. And this is exactly why I set out to become a first-time gun owner. The Heller ruling gave me the ability to own a gun, and I learned firsthand that I had to defend myself when the police aren't there. And so I have come from, as I said in the beginning, someone who had never shot a gun two years ago, to someone who's standing at H&H Shooting Sports talking about the importance of the Second Amendment and gun rights, and it's really taken me from such a different place. And 
The last line of my book, I think, it summarizes where I've come from and where I am now. I really I write, um, God gave us the right to defend ourselves, whether from dangerous citizens or tyrannical government. Our founding fathers said those rights cannot be infringed. I generally don't call myself pro-gun. I choose to describe myself as pro-Second Amendment. A gun is just a tool, but the spike is for freedom. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Phil Don, Phil back here, Phil Robertson back here. The, uh, that's a joke, that's a joke. Oh. Right. Okay. We need a duck call. We need more than a duck call, I can assure you. The, uh, anyway, great presentation, thank you very much. Now we'll get into our Q&A, but before we actually do, you see up there in your little table there's like one of these little deals here. That, now, we know that everyone, including the ladies, like jewelry. This is the most important piece of jewelry that they ever have. So I'm going to present that to you. Okay? Thank you. Now, there's a couple very famous people also in Washington, D.C. that also have those, and they consider that a great honor. One of them is a, an XCA director by the name of James Woolsey. Wow. Who I was sitting right there in presentation, right there at that podium. Another one is Frank Gaffney, under Secretary of Defense. Frank Gaffney's got one of those. So you get to the ranks of very precious jewelry. So, so you walk in the streets. So, so by the way, when you walk in the streets, you walk in the streets, everybody's talking about the High Noon Club in Oklahoma City and H&H &H Shooting Sports. I know that's to be true. All right? I've been hearing about it for years. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Now, if anybody has a Q&A, now we, we've got... We've got to have Emily out here at this desk out here to do her book signings at 1 o'clock. So we need to clear the room at 1 o'clock and get ready for a Q&A. So we've got about 10 to 15 minutes to ask some questions. Now, if you get the opportunity to ask a question, don't make a statement. Ask a short question so she can give short answers so we can do that. Okay, raise your hands. Number one. Your name, sir. I'm Glenn Howard. I'm curious, uh, the people you talk to in the Washington, D.C. area, particularly other journalists, when you're off the air, what kind of response are you getting from them? You know, I'll tell here's a shot. Most journalists are liberals and anti-gun and anti really? shotgun. Oh, really? Yeah, shocking. I know. <laughs> so, I mean, they probably think I'm like nutty and they don't know what to make of it. And they always go, and I'm walking in the Capitol, you know, like, so they're just going like, are you packing? They always say that. <laughs> First of all, everybody, no, have any of you ever said that to your friends? Like, are you packing? Like, it's just such a stupid, and I'm like, no, I've been through a metal detector. No. Um, but it really was a, a shocker to me is that, which is kind of neat, ATF decided they were doing some outreach to the um, reporters about two months ago, and they took us to their shooting range to shoot um, all these class three guns, but only in semi mode, which was kind of a disappointment but for me. But um, I know. But um, anyway, so we got, it was a van full of, of all basically liberal reporters. It was you know, AP, NPR, CNBC, CNN, Washington Post, all these guys. And first of all, none of them had ever shot a gun before, which is just astounding to me. These are all the people who cover this issue. They don't even know it. They've never touched it. It's just astounding to me. And then when they start asking questions, they ask the most biased questions, like, to the, and ATF, to their credit, were like, are, are these people, I could see in their faces, <laughs> just, I'm the, uh, they're the reporters? With which, kind, which gun did we shoot was assault weapon? Which gun did we shoot was high powered? Is that <laughs> high powered ammo? I mean, all these, and, and so I just kept like, there's no such thing as high powered ammo, or there's no such thing as an assault weapon, you know, I was just getting so frustrated with the situation. And then we went to shoot the gun. Shoot, it was just, it was so embarrassing. You got grown men like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man up! They got your gun <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I volunteered to shoot each one first, and I was having a great time. And first of all, it was all this ammo. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, have you ever went to a Benihana restaurant where they're doing the, you know, the Japanese are doing all that quick food? Those are called assault knives. <laughs> okay, question. Emily, my name is Paul, and I was wondering, is a concealed carry permit possible to get in D.C., and if it is, are you going to try to get one? 
Um, DC, is, the, your nation's capital, is the only place in the country that does not recognize the right to bear arms. Which, I put the Second Amendment at the very beginning of my book to make sure that there would ever be any confusion about what it says. It says the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So bearing arms means carrying them. DC does not allow anyone to take a gun outside the home, except for the criminals. They're fully allowed to take the gun out of the home. And they do, and they shoot us. Um, it's being challenged in court, the court for the Palmer case. It's been slowed down deliberately. It started in 2009. Alan Gura, who is the Heller lawyer, is the lead lawyer for it. They've slowed it down. It's been going on now for four years. We can't get a decision on it. Um, Illinois was the last state that didn't have carry rights. And as you all know, just this year, the courts overturned that law because it is obviously unconstitutional. And now they, the, their legislature has passed and they have carry rights. Um, I think a big issue on a national level is these may carry states versus these shall carry states, and it's being challenged in a lot of states. Um, the Second Amendment Foundation's got a lot of cases on this, um, and it's you know states like Maryland where you you have to prove is being challenged, or Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Illinois, we need to prove reason. Not Illinois as much. Prove reason to have a, get a carry permit. Um, is one of the big things that I hope the Supreme Court takes up before it get before Obama gets to put another one of his choices on it because I think that we're going to find that these may issue states are not going to be held up but it's going to take a while. DC it's just it's completely unconstitutional it it but they're dragging out as long as possible and um, so no I can't get a care permit what I probably will do just to uh, do is get a non-resident one and so I can carry in other places. Good idea. Thank you. Good answer. Question. Good answer. Hi, Emily. My name is Morty. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you don't mind answering this question, where were you born and brought up? I was born in Baltimore. And um, it was not, it was definitely not a pro gun house, but my dad secretly had a gun. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Which I, when I was a kid, I was in the back seat playing on the floor, and the car, he was driving, the car stopped suddenly, and a revolver, I didn't know what it was at the time, gun came out. And I was like, and I never said anything to my father. And then when I went to get a gun, when I got to the point of actually the four months was ending, I was talking to my dad on the phone, and he was like, wait, you're actually going to keep the gun? And I was like, oh, well, Dad, what do you think I'm going to do with it? He goes, I thought you were just doing it for the newspaper. I was like, no, I'm doing this to go. And he goes, oh, you're going well, to hurt yourself. <laughs> you're going to hurt yourself. Someone's going to break in your apartment. And then they're going to get your gun. And they're going to shoot you. Now, here down here, I know you encourage your daughters to have guns and you've grown up with them. But when you're from Baltimore, it, you just you don't raise a daughter to shoot. And so I just, you know, I don't blame him. And I said, no, Dad, I'm getting trained. I, no one's going to, I'm going to get him. I don't like this, Emily. I don't like this. And I said, well, you had a gun. He's like, what? <laughs> And I was like, I saw it. He goes, you remember? So he remembers. <laughs> just, just last year, it finally comes to light. I, so I was like, oh, Dad, I think I might want to interview you for my book. <laughs> so I did. And he was not, and I was like, can you repeat that, please, so I can quote you accurately. So it's in the book. But basically, um, he he worked in a, his company was in this, this terrible part of downtown of Baltimore. And um, in order to... Um, he was, he was carrying a lot of cash and as you do deals with cash. And so he, it was the same law then as it is now that you had to prove it. So he decided to get a gun. And I said, because I'm so familiar with the Brady background laws that I said, he said his cousin, he said, my cousin's really big into guns, so he bought it for me. And I said, well, how did you do a background check? And he's like, what? Because, you know, back then you didn't have to. It's just, um, so he, his cousin got him a revolver, he had it, and then he went to get the carry permit, and he actually remembered, he said it took months and months, he had taken bank statements, he had taken letters of recommendation, he had taken all this proof, and he finally got a carry permit, he had a revolver, and he kept it holstered under his seat. Um, so, and I said, Dad, whatever happened to that guy? He said, well, I kept it at the top of my, moved to the offices, I kept it at the top of my dresser so you girls couldn't get it. And I said, well, then what happened to it? And he's like, I took it to a gun buyback for 50 bucks at the police station. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I hope I'm going to well. Mm. So I asked him if he would get an AR-15 for me to keep, and he told me that was straw trafficking. And that was the end of the conversation. 
Okay, you know, I don't understand. You, your dad dealt in cash, and you've got cousins that has guns. Okay. Next one. Emily, thanks for being with us. My name is Jill Miner. I am a native Coloradan. I don't know what they're doing. I guess they're breathing the mile high air up there. Yeah. Uh, questions. Uh, we, I have heard, and I'm kind of asking you to confirm this if you've ever come across this. I remember reading somewhere that uh, after World War II, uh, a gentleman inquired of one of the Japanese admirals that after Pearl Harbor, they had us at their knees. Why didn't they send their fleet onto the Pacific West Coast? And the Admiral says, we knew all Americans had guns. Have you ever run into that comment? I've heard that, yes. And I mean, I think it's so important to look back and remember why our founding fathers wrote the Second Amendment. And, you know, we've talked more on the logic stuff today, but we're just talking in the, on the, the philosophy of our country was based on is that they believed that the fear of government tyranny, and they, you know, they just gotten out from a, a, the king, a, a king of England, George, and they never wanted that to happen again. So the idea, the reason that they put this as the Second Amendment was in order to prevent it ever happening again because the populace, the government, the tyrannical government, would always be afraid of an armed populace. It also benefits, obviously, foreign governments who don't have armed citizens, they know that ours are. You're not gonna see an invasion because they know we can defend ourselves. But the most important reason was to prevent a tyrannical government. And so what we're seeing right now with a, uh, I would say a quite, the most tyrannical like president we've had in many a year. Amen, amen. Ever. Um, <laughs> you know, who thinks that we want board control and government we want to listen to your phone calls on the NSA. We want to control your health care, tell you what you need to own and how you need to own. We want more of your taxes so we can send in Washington. We want more of your money in Washington, and we want to tell you what kind of guns you're allowed to buy and how to protect them. Well, these things are defended in our Constitution. That's why I think in the end, of course, we'll overturn these laws like the ones in Colorado because it's just not based on what our country is founded on. Great. Next question. Hi, Emily. I'm Sally. Um, you mentioned to your dad that you would get training so you wouldn't hurt yourself. I, I'm assuming there are no gun ranges in D.C., so do you have to, where do you do your training, and is it difficult to do, and do you get to train as often as you'd like? Since you don't have an H&H, &H, with I know, this, I have to say, truly, I've, I've said this several times, Miles, I have never seen a shooting range or a, a sto gun store that is so, bright and airy and open and clean. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's such a different experience than anything I've ever seen. And um, I mean, uh, my personal range is Sharpshooters. It's the closest one to DC. It's in Lorton, Virginia. It's about 30 minute drive. Um, and I love those guys and they love me and it's my favorite place, but it, it, it doesn't look anything like this. <laughs> and you know, and I, and so I do go every couple of months, um, but I, I, there's nothing even similar to anything like this near DC. The other closest range is the NRA headquarters range, which is very nice. It's not a store or anything. Um, it's a beautiful range itself, but it's just a range. You know, you would not sit and have a meeting or have something to eat or anything like that. Um, I, you know, I go every couple of months and and you know just go and practice um, just to you know keep up on it because I do you know as I, I keep it loaded at home and unlocked, so I you know need to be prepared. And my dad, I will say, my dad has kind of chilled out on the whole issue and because I tell him I train regularly and he's conceded if it makes me feel safer then he's going to support it. So I think it just took a while for him to get over the daughter having a gun thing. <laughs> but I'm trying to get him to go to the range with me and he says he hasn't been since the army reserves or the army. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I'm Mike. Excuse me. Don't you think that part of the problem with the uh, um, the proper interpretation of the Second Amendment, because if they interpreted the Second Amendment right, they probably have to interpret all the other amendments correctly also. So they want to have leeway any time they can? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this government is so out of control, you know? And I include I, I at the end of my book, I, know, I wrote this book um, April, May, June, and we started undercovering the IRS going after conservative groups and the NSA is spying on all our phone calls and reading our emails. And you know, this government has gotten so out of control in size 
And it, that was not, that is not American. I mean, we need to shrink in, in all aspects. And Second Amendment is part of it, and guns are part of it, our taxes are part of it, the money is part of it. But it is, we are so bloated in Washington. So much control has shifted to Washington out of the states. And it really needs to shift back because, you know, this is not what our founding fathers, forget, even if you look at modern days, this is not what Americans want. They don't want to, to give all their, I mean, now you have this health insurance plan, Obamacare, where you can't get your health, you have to get health insurance, and you have to get through a system and a broken website, and then we have a president who lies to us and says if you like your, your health care plan, you can keep it, knowing full well you can't. If you like your doctor, you can keep it, knowing full well. I mean, it flat out lies. That's what happens when they have too much power in Washington. Look, I'm in Washington, I want you all to have more power. I want it out of there. Because, and that's why when all, whenever people in America complain that they don't work enough in Congress and they're home too much, I'm like, get them out of here. <laughs> as long as they're here, they're passing more laws. They have never passed a law that shrunk government. Exactly. And they've never passed a law that saved money. So I don't. I never understand this mentality of like, oh, they have so much. Baby. They're home all the time. I'm like, leave them home. I'd rather they come for two weeks a year, pass a budget, and leave. We can start shrinking this thing back down to the size it should be. Question. Hi, my name is Pat. Uh, the question I had. You mentioned earlier uh, about Bloomberg. And he's no longer the mayor of New York City, correct? But uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel, who's the mayor of Chicago. It, you know, he used to be the uh, press secretary or whatever, the chief of staff, right, of uh, the current administration. And of course, his brother now is one of the architects of the Obamacare. I mean, uh, are they, are they, do you know any inside information that work together on a big push on this thing with the, with between uh, Bloomberg and uh, Emmanuel? Um, on guns? Yes. Well, uh, one of the races that Bloomberg spent over a million dollars was the Chicago race last year. Um, it was it was between it was not in uh, it was a special election. And he spent over a million dollars just on one race in, it was in the Chicago area to make sure it was a pro gun anti gun person. And he says he's spending twenty five million dollars in this upcoming election. He will no longer be mayor soon, so he's got nothing to do but go after our guns. Our sodas, <laughs> you know, he's got New York completely smushed under his power, and now he's just, and he has, and I mean, as much as we can dislike him and his politics, money does buy stuff, you know? If you run enough ads, and the ads are done by really fancy marketing people in New York, and they know how to convince people, people who, you all are so educated on these issues, people who are just in the middle, and Miles and I are talking the, last night at dinner, People are just going about their day and doing their job and taking care of their families. It's hard to get really read up on the issues. And then you catch an ad and it makes sense and it's reasonable and kind of persuades you. And um, so, you know, the power that Bloomberg has is that's money, you know, and um, unfortunately. And I think, you know, it's going to definitely affect the 2014 election and also the other side, both the Republican Party or the pro gun groups are going to have to spend a whole lot more money than they plan to because of this change dynamic. Emily, thank you very much for coming to Hoi Nino Club. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's give you a round of applause. I know, I know that everyone does not get that answer to the question that you may want to ask. Thank you, Dr. Richard. But Emily will be at the table out here to my right, signing books, taking autographs, doing all that kind of stuff. So again, thanks for coming. Next, next week, there will be no hiding books. Stay home, see your family.